couple questions that I want you guys to answer. You should see, number one, is client retention an issue for you at the present moment? And just give your vote there. And then number two, have you lost clients as a direct result of the current crisis? Which two questions that I think are gonna be related to the discussion. So it looks like 86%, anywhere from 80 to 85% of people are saying that client retention is an issue right now. Maybe three fourths of you. Uh, almost 80% saying you have lost clients as a direct result of the current crisis. And it's like, you know, if you guys are clinicians, sometimes you lose your clients because you just discharge them, you know, all is well, I don't need to see you anymore, but let's say your plan of care wasn't finished yet. And, and the patient was just so affected by the current situation or the client that they couldn't keep coming in. So that's kind of what we're talking about now. And it looks like, yeah, 75 to 80% of guys are answering yes, client retention issue. And I'm, I'm losing people because of the current crisis. And that's going to be what we talk about with Sam. We're really happy to bring you on. Thanks so much for being here. And, and before we dig into uh, some of the questions that we have for you, can you do a little bit about your, your background, what's, uh, where you are now with, with True Coach, and when we can go from there? Yep. Uh, so as uh, thank you guys for the introduction and happy to be on here and, and help and uh, try to provide value in this industry that I care so much about. Uh, I've been in it since 2008. Uh, uh, so right now, I currently serve as the vice president of brand at True Coach. Uh, basically, I oversee all of the organic marketing strategy that comes out from us as a company, from the blog to social media to video content to events uh, that would fall under to my bucket. Prior to being here in Boulder, Colorado with the True Coach team, I spent the last four years at Onnit, where I oversaw strategic partnerships, bringing in partnerships with Exos, Equinox, Gold's Gym, UCLA. Uh, I was uh, one of the executive team members of the education team, building out the seven courses of education that Onnit works with delivering said education. Uh, and then I was also a performance coach working with a number of athletes. Uh, and I work mostly with a pitcher by the name of Jake Arietta, who plays for the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, and so I got to do quite a bit of different things with on it. Uh, prior to that, I was in Portland, Oregon, where I started my fitness career uh, in 2008 during the last awesome economic uh, opportunity of our era, where it was a time where it wasn't just hard to get a job in your field, it was hard to get a job in general. Uh, so I actually went to school to, uh, for entrepreneurship, business communications, uh, to look at startups basically was really where I was, uh, in, in my realm and, uh, ended up in fitness because in 08, there were no jobs. And so I sold gym memberships at 24 hour fitness later got into powerlifting, Olympic lifting, strongman competitions, uh, then later, uh, uh, tried to get out of fitness. And that's what moved me to Austin, Texas to, uh, get out of fitness industry entirely. Uh, and I was the very first member of the on it gym when it opened up in 2014. So, uh, it's where, it's where I've been. Well, you weren't out of the fitness industry if you were with on it. Yeah. Well, I lasted yeah, yeah. about five months entirely out of it, you know? <laughs> well, uh, I met you, Sam was at on it when I did the clinical athlete weightlifting uh, certification there. And you, I mean, you took care of us and, and the ran a, a fantastic event and Thank you. what has now kind of led you to your role at true coach and what, what is that role of, as VP brand? Because I think it's going to be important. Yeah. For the discussion here, we talk about retaining our clients. Well, you know, so for me, you know, as you guys can probably get from this video, I'm pretty extroverted. I'm kind of just a high energy, high frequency kind of guy. And as a, as a young professional, I always got scared, especially as a trainer. Uh, I always got scared of being the sales guy, right? Because I have no problem walking into a room and trying to be the center of attention, right? Like, that, that doesn't bother me. So I had to figure out a way to help people understand how to do what I do without like trying to be this. And so um, I really, I, I really uh, value uh, introspection and value and uh, uh, looking at um, the big picture. And so marketing was always that big picture of sales, right? Like how are people starting the conversation? And that's always where I wanted to get my career. And I did enough of that at True Coach, or sorry, at Onnit, uh, in the space, because on it's obviously a marketing machine, even though I wasn't a direct marketing employee, I had a podcast, Quinn, you've been on it. And, uh, and then that curtailed me to show me that like, hey, I can do a role in content. I can do a role inside of a marketing vertical. And I have enough experience to do it for a fitness company, right? I'm not qualified to go be the vice president of brand for REI or for Nordstrom, right? Like, but for a fitness company that's directly towards personal trainers, or, or therapy or individual service providers for, for fitness. Uh, I definitely can speak that language, right? It's like, so for me, it's really important from a VP of brand, that means marketing. 
And so for me, how much do you guys hate as clinicians that you read a piece of content from a, a, maybe a tool you guys use or a company that you support and it's so out of touch with what you guys do as actual clinicians or therapists that you're like, if it wasn't for the product being awesome, like the message sucks or I hate the way it looks or how many fitness photos have we seen of a row that just looks terrible and you're like, how did it make it through this many layers of fitness people that this is put on a nine by 20 background of some, you know what I mean? You're like, whoa. So it was really important for me to build authenticity into a medium to where people could actually read an article and look at content and say like, oh shit, like that has my best interest at play. Like it's not just for clicks. It's not just for the marketing game. Like you're not just reading like clickbaity articles. Like it's actual things that help because the downfall, and it's the same with physical therapy as well as it is in, in personal training, that sales becomes the root cause of success in this industry, which sucks. It's not how much you know. If that were the case, then we'd have a lot more really successful trainers and therapists. But in order to get enough reps in early in your career, you have to sell enough sessions or be put in an environment to sell enough sessions. So for me, it was really like, okay, how can I give back to a community that's given me a career that I very much value, right? So that's, that's why I got into the brand space. That's why I got into the marketing space is it's always been the direction I wanted to go was big picture strategy compared to just being the sales guy and the, the guy foot on the ground and, you know, handshakes and kissing babies. And so it turned into how do I put myself in a scenario to affect the most amount of people? And getting in the marketing space, definitely, especially towards uh, therapists and trainers, um, was that direction. And so now I get to really focus on what a message is and help people find the right people like you guys uh, to get to where they need to succeed in their careers. So we have a good mix of, of clinicians, coaches, and trainers. And uh, usually on these shows, there's about, a I would say, a 60-40 mix, clinicians to coaches or trainers. And right now, what's interesting is that clinicians, so we don't get marketing. And that's why I was really excited for this show because it doesn't matter. So Sam's not a clinician and he was a coach and now, and he has a marketing background and that's what he does, but that doesn't matter because these principles are going to transcend it, the whole, all both fields. And what are, what the clinicians are, are really realizing that the coaches already knew was part of the game, whether they were any good at it or not, is this idea of value, defining your value, selling yourself, because in the healthcare space, a lot of the clinicians are behind the safe pay or safe wall of insurance and just being an employee. And so they're just being fed people because that's part of the system. But all with their, their clinic doors closed temporarily, there's questions about insurance and telehealth and all these things. So it's like, crap. Well, so cash pay is like the option here that we need to go after. And now it's like, oh, I'm now I'm in this space that I don't know how to navigate. So when you say, because David's got a really good question here that he threw in the Q&A, mm -hmm. and I think it's a good start. He, yeah. he asks, how does Sam define value? So whether you're a clinician or a coach, defining value for yourself and then exuding that value and, and getting the audience to understand that value, where does the, how does that start? You know, we all have to in, like look back at ourselves and say, hey, why did we even get in this journey? right? Like, let's be honest, we don't get into the therapist trainer world, because we're expecting to make it big. Like, we're not elementary teachers, but we're, we're kind of in the like, we, we all know we're getting into a grind, right? But we all do it because we inherently like really care about the process. We really care about the outcomes that we can that we can elicit, right? For some people, that's, I tore my ACL in high school, and I just had a really kick ass physical therapist. And like, I really like the body and I love the return to play aspect. Like, I want to do that in my career or you're a competitive athlete and you're looking at like, hey, there's um, a linchpin of dysfunction that's not getting looked at. I also look at movement through this lens of perspective of physical therapy. How does the snatch and the clean and jerk also deliver from these principles from me as a physical therapist, right? Like we all have these journeys that led us down a particular path of how we got to where we are, right? The experiences that we've chosen to live through. And I think that's super, super important to honor because inherently that's the, those are the learning experiences that we've all been through. And so the person that's currently going through that, it's so much easier to talk to them because we were already there. We know exactly what they were going through, right? Like how often do we find ourselves in a spot to where, um, you know, someone who like, they tell you, they like, oh man, I know I've been needing to get in shape. And then they just, you're like, okay, well, like, what, what do we need to do to help? And you're like, uh, you know, and they just don't want to, right? Like they're constantly in that space, but like, that's because they're guarded, they're scared. Versus like, 
okay, maybe they come to it because, and I'm going to use a really easy one, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but maybe you're someone that struggled with your relationship with food as a young individual adolescent, and uh, you're talking to someone at a family barbecue, and you're also a physical therapist uh, that, you know, just like any other physical, let's just say you're a physical therapist in town, and uh, you're talking to someone at a barbecue, and all of a sudden you hear some things, you're like, oh man, like I'm hearing some things that I definitely recognize that I've been through myself, right? How can you guide that conversation to that person saying like, hey, I'm with you, like I've been there, like we have something in common. Because now in the, in the flood of physical therapists in the world, that person who probably has pain, like let's be honest, most people have some sort of pain, um, that it turns into like, oh, if I'm gonna have someone touch me or work on me, right? Then it's like, wow, this person like gets me, right? Because how often do we hear like, they, when you start talking to someone about their health journey, it's like, well, you know, like, you know, I, I, I get like, I got low back pain, but like, I'm different. like you know, my hips are out of alignment or, and it's like such the way they present their situation is so like, yeah, like, I know you've heard this before, but like mine's different. Right. And that's because they're guarded to where like, if you know intrinsically, like what your values are as to why you got in this industry or what you went through, or maybe some of the emotions that you've been through with pain or with movement or the way your body feels that you can latch onto that. It really creates a different value proposition. It really creates a different dialogue with that particular person that that creates a very different conversation to where we're really looking at like, oh shit, you are the person that can help me get from A to B, right? Let's be honest, as therapists, trainers, uh, clinicians, we are in the business of helping people develop better relationships with their health and body and helping them get out of pain. We are in the most target rich environment from a marketing perspective of all time. Mr. Olympia getting off the stage is walking off stage being like, could have done that better. And you're like, yeah, okay, right? Like. Uh, <laughs> It's this game where like it, it, people are, are in, they constantly want to get better and they want to look to someone that can be like, oh, you can help me, right? Like, and so I don't care if you're a therapist or a coach or a trainer, like you are a coach, you are a guide, you are their Yoda. Like for whatever reason they see in you that you're the person that can help take them from A to B, right? Because let's be honest, there's a million people out there, especially with Instagram right now, like, oh, do this for low back pain, do this for low back pain, do this for low back pain. And you guys, like how often, like, oh, I've done all the things. I've done that thing. And you're like, oh, like they, they're solution aware. They're problem aware. They just haven't found the one that they've actually stuck to, right? How much of your guys' prescriptive work is like getting them to actually do it more so than the thing, right? Because we know at this point, like psychology trumps physiology every time, right? So it turns into like, it's never about like grandma Betty, like, yeah, like, especially if you're a home health person, right? Like that person, showing that person's house, they had a hip surgery. They don't care about doing physical therapy. Right. But it turns into like, oh, I saw like, you know, someone like whoever plays baseball, like, oh yeah, I play, but you know, whatever, finding a way to create values into where you can exchange a conversation to where you can break that wall down. And that's where I think that we have to decide what our value is. And in turn, looking back, like, Hey, what thing did I go through that caused me to become a physical therapist? Right. Or what caused me to become a trainer? Because, and I teach this story arc, uh, a book you guys should all go get right now is called Building a Story Brand with Donald Miller, if you haven't read it. And go get that book, that's amazing. But I teach the story arc thing because, yeah, you got, most people aren't me. Most people will not go into that room like, hey, watch this, I can literally be the center of attention. Uh, and so, because I don't, I love small talk, I love getting to know people, I love interviewing people and getting to know them. But most people are very guarded around that and they don't. Like how many people go into conversation? They're like, I don't know what to say. And you're like, oh, just talk, right? Like have a conversation with them. But like, they're not used to doing that. So then it, like, I really think it comes down to like, hey, what do you have inside of you? Like, what do you know? Like what got you into this point? And I think that's what helps carry your values to the next conversation to where now for a lot of you therapists or trainers who are an in-person model where you're experiencing that maybe some people didn't want to go from the in-person to remote because the message is now off. Maybe you went from like sending a message to where I have to have my hands on you or I have to be smashing you in the gym to where now like, oh, but it's just as valuable for me to tell you to do these things versus is if you're a clinician, you're like, hey, like Grandma Betty, I know we've been talking about getting that low back to release and not be so tight so you can get your shuffleboard game on. But, you know, as much as we've talked about like the manual therapy stuff that we do and I know that you love it, I also give you these exercises because we both decided that these were things that fit within your lifestyle you could do, right? And so if your message has been like, hey, empowering them to do things on their own and empowering them with education and information, you now become that leader because you've guided them, you've built that trust. And that's why they're like, oh yeah, I wanna keep paying for your services even though I'm you know, at home this entire time.
I'll keep paying your gym or I'll keep paying my membership or I'll keep paying my whatever. So I'm a big believer that value is the driver of all of it. What value do you have to offer to the world? And what value do you have to offer to your clients, right? Am I the world's best Olympic lifter? F no, right? Like when I quickly realized that there is 97 pound Chinese girls that snatch more than my back squat, I'm like, this is not the sport I have a future in, right? So I really like it. But if I had someone who like really loved Olympic lifting and like, yeah, I'll get you going. We might do some stuff together to build that, but I'm going to find a way to get them to, to Quinn as quick as possible. Like, yeah, do you need a remote coaching experience? Hey Quinn, this is what we've done. This is where she's been. Go see him. Cause this is what he does, right? Like that's the story that you've built. And that's a story that I can pass over. Sure. I built trust, but now I can put you in a better light because she trusts me or they trust me. Right. But I value guys. Sorry. I'm on a tangent now, but values everything. You drove that, that pretty well home. But one thing I want to kind of hammer and drill down into here is for a long time, we've made the error as professionals of just looking at our value as having the solution. Totally. And it's, it's more than that. Now, you know, a, another great book is purple cow. Mm -hmm. When we look at these things, having a solution, everybody has a solution at this point. Like you can go on Instagram, they all got it. Everybody's got some secret, everybody, has whatever it is. I don't care what he's saying. And what he meant with, you know, building a story brand and being a guide is it's more than just having the solution. It's being able to identify the problem and then relate to that problem and show that you are the guide to get through that, to get to the solution that we all inherently have. Yep. You have to have that as a differentiator to create value everybody has a solution whether you agree with that solution or not it doesn't really matter the key is is relating to your client what their problem is and then leading them to that solution that that's how that value is created would it be okay if i contextualize that for a second yeah go for it man okay so guys if, let's look at this from a, a practicality standpoint so if i was a physical therapist or a trainer in my hometown i come from a small town in kelso washington that's 17,000 people that's super blue collar. And let's say I came in, I went back home to be go, become a trainer. And I wanted to work with youth athletes. I thought that we had a grove of kids uh, that wanted to do it. Well, okay, my game is gonna be like, yeah, I have a name in the community, but I would wanna start showing up like, dang, Saturdays at, uh, at Tam O'Shanna Park, it's every mother and their child playing soccer, baseball, softball, whatever. Like, I'm out there shaking hands, what's up, how you doing? Right. Making sure people know that, like, hey, I'm supporting the youth sports. I supported I sponsored all seven sports, whatever. Right. Just to make myself available. There's not a sell. It's purely like, hey, man, I'm Sam. It's nice to meet you. Um, physical therapist. I'm a trainer, blah, 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 blah. Right. And you're just around. Be friendly. Walk away. Like, don't be a creeper. Right. And then it's like, <laughs> I know that's tough. Uh, but then it's like, oh, shit. If you see that dude every Saturday and all of a sudden your kid's the one that sprains his ankle, and that uh, you, yeah, trainer runs out and tapes that ankle or therapist runs out and tapes that ankle without even anybody saying shit. Like that community is going to look up and say, like, holy crap. Like that dude's like taking care of our kids, right? From a small town setting, like you get a couple people in a good community, like you're the guy, right? Okay. Let's say you're not that person. Let's say you're someone that maybe like, and this is most people moving probably into telehealth or into more of a remote coaching setting and a training is a lot of people get into it because they think it gets them away from having to do the in-person sales aspect. Okay, you're right. It does do that. It can do that. But now, instead of being able to show people your character by going and taping a kid's ankle or helping people out or warming kids up just for fun, just to be around, that means you better have a marketing or a content strategy that reaches people when you're not in front of them directly, right? Is that your social media? Is that your blog post? Is that your uh, newsletter, right, that's going out? And then you have to look at, okay, who am I targeting? When we're in person, we don't, we have geography on our side. We don't necessarily need to have a specific, we're just the physical therapist in town. We can kind of get away with that message. If you're in a big ass city, you might need to specialize a little more, be the running guy, or you might be the weightlifter guy. You might be the powerlifter guy that kind of just gets that, right? Like, um, not that John Quint or Quinn are, you know, have different expertise in their spaces, but like John's going to get a different plethora of people being at West Side than Quinn will hanging out with the, the juggernaut crew, right? Like there's just going to be different ways people are getting, right? So, but what this comes back down to is if you're writing a blog post or you're having social media and you're trying to reach people now in a digital age, you now have to build that value. You have to build that friendly, like, oh my God, look how nice he is or she is, right? You have to build that value as to like, oh, he writes a lot of really good articles to parents about what parents can do to help their youth athletes, right? Because every parent thinks, wants their kid to be the next LeBron. Who doesn't want their kid to be the next, next LeBron, 
right? So if I'm a therapist or I'm a trainer in a town, crap, I'm writing an article every week about like, hey, here's 10 things you need to know about your youth kids when they're playing double headers on Saturdays in the heat. Here's five things you should be doing to help your kids, uh, you know, get stronger, right? And it's like eating, like, I remember the first 13 year old kid I trained, his mom was the uh, VP of wellness for Intel, right? And he was an undersized kid and uh, she's like, yeah, he wants to play football. And as I talked to him, like Paul didn't want to play football. He just wanted to work out. He just didn't know how. And, uh, you know, day one, we just, we played and we hung out, we moved around. And, and then I was like, Hey, like, what do you eat for breakfast? He's like, I don't know. I don't really eat breakfast. And I was like, all right, well, if you don't like, if you don't mind eggs, like I'd love for you to eat eggs and like spinach in the mornings. And I left it pretty casual because he's 12. His mom calls me, what did you do? And I said, what? She goes, we about had to pull over and have a fit because we didn't stop at the store to get eggs and spinach. Cause you told Paul to eat eggs and spinach. So this kid thinks it's the law. I haven't been able to get this kid to eat a vegetable in forever. Yeah, but I'm like, I'm not mom. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, that's what you're doing. So now you can be that message to the kids, but you can also be that message to the parents, right? Like, how can you be that guide? And so now you have to look at like an in-person strategy has to be in a digital setting, like as we're, as we're talking about to where, okay, do you have your values lined up to where, how do I really help people? Could Quinn, sorry, I just know Quinn the best here, so it's easy for me to use an example. Could Quinn help a marathoner? For sure, right? Does he market himself as the best, marathon, <laughs> the best marathon therapist, clinician on the planet? No. But if one of his patients is like, hey, man, I'm going to get ready to run a marathon, like, can blah, 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 blah. Yeah, for sure, right? Like, he's able to do it, right? He's just choosing, like, hey, my value proposition, my choice is to spend my focus in this medium because this is what I really care about. This is what I'm really good at. This is what I really love. And this is where my passion is, right? You talking about what you need to do for one of your uh, lifters is going to be a probably a way different session than someone who's coming in for like plantar fascia because they're running all the time. Like, you know what I mean? Just the prescriptions that you give and the way you talk, not like just, and that's just because your internal values are like, man, you love this thing, right? So it doesn't mean anything, go with it, right? If you're someone that loves um, manual therapy, right? Don't try to be the FRC guy, right? Be the manual therapy guy, right? And you go, like, this is where the value is. This is where my value comes man, I had such bad back pain, I could never get out of it. And then I met a physical therapist that blah, 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 blah. And then I became a physical therapist and blah, 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 right? And now I've really helped, blah, 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 right? So the value game plays so, so huge, whether you're in person, a trainer, a therapist, online or in person, that understanding our game is the most important thing we can possibly do. So it's to find their, and I'm, I don't say this literally, but find the person's pain points and pain points is just what their perceived problem is or what they, the things that they want to address. How does your expertise address that, 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 and really then first of all, you have to listen to their problem. So it's like what John said, empathy is, is different than sympathy. Empathy is uh, being able to relay their problem back to them either as good or better than they did because you have the expertise in the context around it. I have a couple avenues that I want to go here, Sam, because we've mostly been talking about, I think, getting in front of an audience mm -hmm. and potentially getting in front of a new audience. We're going to shift the conversation eventually to retaining, and we probably maybe even should start this reverse engineering, but, yeah. but keeping the clients that we have as client retention. But I want to ask, because this, is, this question is going to come up, and I think intuitively it makes sense to people to say, okay, define my value, listen to the 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 problems of my potential audience and empathize with them, listen to them, and then kind of uh, inject my value and see if, and see if that can help. It's like, that makes intuitive sense. But those people, who are those people and how do I get those people? And you wrote a blog post recently on True Coach, maybe no more than a week ago. And I think it answers some of these questions, but how, who should people be reaching out to when you say you you write a blog post, you do a, a post, you send an email, who are you doing these things for? What if somebody feels like they don't have any people? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, and this is something I constantly battle with. How do I refine this message, right? Because you're right, intuitively, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to sit and like, yeah, that makes sense to do. But then, you know, I saw it on a, on a post the other day. It's like, I used to have 10 clients, I have zero. I, do, I post on Instagram and Facebook, it never works. Like, how do I get people? And I've been consistently looking at, like, how do we look at this? Because the, my personal answer is 
go get more people and figure in the market will tell you, right? Like eventually, like when I was a trainer at 24, like I just said yes to as many clients, sold as many clients as I could on their goals, right? I'm selling value to them. And then it turned into like, oh, eventually I started seeing that my clientele kind of weeded themselves out. I had like majority like type A females, right? Like that was executive type A females that were like, like that was kind of my jam, right? For whatever reason. And it's not that I didn't, I didn't put the marketing out to them. It just is like, they resonated with my voice for like my style, right? Whereas like Steve, my coworker was a 280 pound power lifter, 700 pound squatter, uh, played football and wrestled in college, right? Looked like the just, you know, has a barbed wire tattoo on his, like, just like he looks angry. And his clientele was like 65 and up year old women, right? Just like mop the floors up with the grandmas. Cause he just had this teddy bear approach. And this dude walked out with like the Tupperwares this guy would walk out with was amazing, right? Cause they all baked for him. And like, we'd all bake goods all the time. It was like, jeez. Um, but you would never guess that, right? You would never guess the 700 pound squatter would be on the leg extension machine with his 70 year old, right? Like, but like, for whatever reason, they value resonated with his voice. So that's one thing I want us to kind of look at is who do we vibe with? Like, who do we, like, you know, when you're sitting in a room and someone walks in the room, like, oh God, like, Jesus, like they just, they scream like you don't like them and you haven't even talked to them, right? It's just like the shirt they're wearing, the way they walk, their backpack. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, I'm from this, that you went to the same college. Dude, what's up? Like you become like instant best friend and you can't explain it, right? But I want people to really take a look at like, who do you resonate with? Like, who are your people? If you're someone that likes to kind of go deep down the hole, right? Are you wanting to talk to 17 year olds? Probably not, right? Like if, you li- if you're a clinician that really loves like uh, clinical trials and reading studies and research and always being on the front line and you want a patient that, that uh, acknowledges that, then you're gonna need to spend time with, you're probably gonna be marketing to trainers, right? Like you're marketing to people who care about that world. So then that your message needs to be like, oh, okay, if that's who I really like talking to, that's who I best talk to, where are they at, right? Like if I'm trying to reach baby boomers, right? If that's who, like, that's, I'm adult fitness. I'm an adult strength training in a suburb town, right? Adult fitness. Um, and I'm trying to, and I run a local gym or, and maybe I do some remote coaching, whatever that is. Am I gonna be doing my advertisements on TikTok where I'm dancing? That was terrible, by the way. I'm sorry for all of you that to see that. Or am I going to be writing long form blog posts in Facebook that are like five ways to get rid of low back pain, right? Like my mom's going to click on an article that's like five ways to get over low back pain more than me doing the floss, right? Or however it goes on TikTok because 60 year old women are not on TikTok. Most of them, right? Or at least my mom's not, Uh, you know what I mean? So like we have to match our message and our voice to where our audience is, right? So if we're looking at from a, a grassroots element, first and foremost, I want you to start and kind of look at like, who do you like working with, right? Like who does your voice really resonate with? And that may not be the person that you necessarily get to work with at this very moment. If you're, if you don't have a full business, right? And you're still growing, uh, cause you gotta eat, but look at like, okay, where do you ideally like to, to spend your time and say, okay, that's where I kind of got to s- start working. And I got to start working to get into that sphere. What does it take to get into that sphere? Do I need to start, um, is, it, is it soccer moms at the local school? Yeah, I'm bringing orange slices and Capri Suns and my friend who's a massage therapist and passing out free massages all day, right, with my car. That's what I would do if I'm a local trainer or physical therapist in a small town, right, personally, right? Because you're just getting in front of people, hey, what's up, how you doing, right? But if you're online and you need to go get those people, right, it seems really daunting because the internet's huge, right? So that's where it really turns into like, all right, what have you really been through? What, why, what is it, what's the real message of fitness that you're really trying to say, right? If you're a strength person and you're a real big strength advocate, right? Then your message needs to be about strength. Like, Hey, we need to get you stronger. We need to put you under a bar. We need to put you under some load. We need to get some adaptation to create the ability to resist unwarranted positional change, right? Like that's our zone. But some of you, I know, or I mean, I know a lot of you are in that space here, but in, in the trainer fitness space, we also have the very big down regulation, uh, you know, yogi community, let's just say, and to where maybe your message is more down red, breathing, it's not lifting, right? Like, okay, there's, there's space for that, right? To be honest, like I'm not trying to get too big and too fluffy, but like, 
then own that space. That's your message. Why did that help you? Right? Like how did you doing Wim Hof breathing every night help you? Right. Or whatever that is. Right. Like, I don't care if you're a, um, you know, heavy manual or FRC or RPR, or like, you know, there's all these different realms people go through, right. From therapists or trainers, right. How does that fit into what you do? Right. Quinn, I'm going to maybe Quinn, uh, quiz you a little bit and kind of go back and forth with you. When you started moving into being really focused around weightlifters, what was that like? Did you get a lot of pushback from people who saw you as a physical therapist and you were maybe not focused on wanting to work with Jen Paul? Or was it hard to get a ton of lifters to come in and see you? What was that like for you being more specialized? Well, I, think it's, I think it's both. First of all, weightlifting is not a big community. So if you had to think about what space you're trying to get into, how big is that space? <coughs> who else is in that space? Uh, what are you potentially walling off other spaces mm -hmm. and so that's more of a perception than anything else i think because like you said was it the then was that a did you get pushback from the general public and i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily call it pushback i would call it a an assumption that i'm not the right person for them so if 65 year old betty mm -hmm. uh wants to be active in my mind i say oh well yeah, the sport of weightlifting is this specific thing, but the principles of, of that qualify and, and apply to you, Betty. But, but from her perspective, she sees me working with a different population and she just automatically assumes that I'm not the right one for her. And then she, I may not even ever hear from Betty. Yeah. Because so it, it, there was that that I was managing it was like doing being in the space that I really, really, really enjoy, but I also enjoy other spaces and I don't want to wall myself off by almost being seen, being uh, perceived as too specific. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that piggybacks really well into Jennifer's question. Uh, Jennifer asked, in order to find a new audience in the current climate, I imagine that as trainers, coaches, physiotherapists, we are going to have to consider a new demographic of people who are working still have disposable income as typically the first thing to go when people do not have disposable income is our services, no matter how much we value. Uh, how could you suggest to try and overcome this and find your new audience? Uh, love this question, Jennifer. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, the big thing, whether you're a trainer or therapist, please stop putting your wallet in other people's pants, right? You might be going through a really tough time. You might be getting your ass handed to you right now. That doesn't mean that the person that wants your services is, right? We, the, I get it, sales is the scariest freaking thing in the world to say, hey, would you like to spend $250 an hour with me to hang out with me because I'm that good looking or something in here is worthwhile, uh, is really tough to do and I get that. But like, you have to, A, you have to own that. You have to own that my experience is worthwhile. Like at some point you have to own your education. Um, but it really comes down to, we can't act like people don't want to spend money. Right? Like there are plenty of people who are working remote and doing their thing or just find situations that are okay. Right. That are actually looking for solutions to buy or to get help. Right. So that I, I say that not to scare you off or not to be mean or to be, but to go, Hey, let's not immediately go that, Hey, we have to look at everything new because people may not want our service. Yeah. There are some people who are in tough spots. They cannot afford their, you know, weekly fit needling sessions or their weekly massages or their trainers, right? But there's also ample people who still can, right? And so that game turns into like, well, were you only marketing to people that did that thing that has that much money? Or are we marketing to an audience that reaches this message, right? If I'm marketing to, you know, um, middle-aged men that used to be high school athletes that want to feel like an athlete again without getting their ass handed to them in the gym, right? Like, there's plenty of 35 to 55 year old executive males that are working that would probably buy into a program because they're at home now going, holy shit, the snack game is strong. And my kids' snacks are even better than my snacks. So holy shit, I need to get this in check. Oh shit, I see this guy, Sam. Oh, he's like, he's mid thirties. Like he's not like a 22 year old. Like, oh, he's in fitness. He trains a bunch of pro athletes. Like, oh, but he like makes fitness really simple. Like his message, isn't using big words. His message is like, oh, make this really simple. And oh, he doesn't make me feel dumb when I read his blog post about what I don't know about fitness or what I'm not doing. Oh, I kind of like that. 
his, his, his values seem to line up with mine. I kind of like his energy. Or most of you are probably going, holy shit, this guy is like a lot. Uh, and I got terrible sleep last night, just so y'all know. I'm like really tired today. Uh, and so, but like, that's the game with social, right? Or the game with content is someone's like, oh, they're reading into you. Like, oh shit, like I, I really enjoy that guy's message to where my values are coming out, right? Like if I, if I go to my page, like I'm not trying to talk to Quinn like a, a, for another doctor of physical therapy to talk about how my staggered stance RDL is gonna increase the tension in my hamstrings by X amount, which is gonna allow me to create tension from the floor of my first pull more efficiently by X degree. Like, could we go down that for sure? But I'm gonna run out of shit to say really, really, really fast. Like that was it, that's all I had. Um, whereas like, oh, okay, I've taken, you know, a number of courses over the years. So how do I just make what really smart people like Quinn say and like make that really simple for this person who's not gonna go to Quinn's course probably, but like at least get that information. That's where I try to live as a fitness brand personally. Like if you found me on social, like that's what I try to do. So it's like, okay, like I'm trying to reach that person who's like my age, 33, 35, 40, that's a, a executive is like, oh damn, like, okay. Like I can not be afraid to get in the gym and lift. I can just move my body, but I come from being a power lifter. So someone who's like, a comes from a big, like I come from mechanical stress and progressive overload and linear periodization is like, oh yeah, he can still lift some weight. Like, okay, I don't mind his message. You know what I mean? Like it's about putting that, what is that value system out there? And I think if we're going from our values out of the gate, then we don't need to worry about like searching about clients who have disposable income or not. We're targeting a value proposition about, hey, my name's Sam. This is the experience I have. This is who I can help. This is how I can help you. I've gone through these experiences. I've helped these people with their experiences. That's how I can help you get from A to B. Grandma Betty, you told me you want to be a 900 pound deadlifter and also the swing dance champion of the world. Okay, we can do that, right? Like I've also helped Grandpa Earl. Like he was the number two badminton player in the world at 97, right? Like, and so that person's like, oh shit, he's helped other old people become fucking studs at their sports, right? Like you're able to bring in those experiences. You're able to bring in what you've done. You're able to bring in your excitement to where that you fire them up. Like you want that client leaving you being like, damn, I want to I want to work with that dude, right? Like, like I really, like, I'm fired up, right? So then it's never about the, like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, it's $250 an hour, right? It's like, no, because what is it? Like, that person's going to be like, oh, man, I love all what you're saying. I really want to do those things with you, but, like, damn, I don't, I don't know if I can spend that money. And it's like, well, I get it, dude. Quinn, you got to go talk to your wife, uh, and I get it. But I also, let's also assume that she does support you in your fitness journey to help you get better, Right? So maybe we can bring her in and talk about it together, right? Like, how do you move the conversation forward? How do you consistently keep building value? How do you not get caught where you're like, uh, it's a no, right? With the sales game, how do you keep adding your value to where it's, oh, it's, I have so much value that you want to work with me. And that also means that you don't need to sell them today, right? Like maybe John's not ready to work with me today. Maybe he's like, oh shit, I really dig Sam's energy. And he's like really fun to listen to, but like, holy shit, I am not ready to work with him three hours a day. Like I will need to up my caffeine intake ninefold. Right. But he's like, it's not that he doesn't like me. So maybe he gives me his email. So that way he subscribes to my news newsletter, which would basically be like, Hey, let's exchange numbers and say up or whatever, uh, to where we can stay in touch. We can keep building trust. We can keep building value. I can keep showing him different versions of what I do in my life. That's like, like oh, yeah, I do this thing like, hey, for any of you guys who have knee pain, like try this thing or whatever. Or here's three ways I've helped my clients with knee pain. And then he reads that article. He's like, damn, my knee's been kind of bugging me. Shit, man. Like I've been following the Sam guy for like three months, six months, four years. Like, oh, he's got online programs. Like maybe I'll do one of those online programs, right? Like that's that value system, right? Where we're consistently telling people, this is what I do. This is how I can help you. I get that you have a unique situation, right? Don't worry about if that person lost their job. Some people did lose their jobs and I feel terrible. I'm so sad that people are gonna go out of business because of this, but there are also people that didn't and you still gotta eat, right? So that means we need to look at, okay, how, and I, guys, I don't, I don't mean to sound like a capitalist freaking uh, Nazi. Like I was very hesitant about putting out content from True Coach. Like, like, let's be honest, remote coaching software, we didn't need to advertise really hard that we're here when COVID hit. It was kind of like, whoa, it kind of just happened, right? Because we've been consistently putting out presence, right? We'd written two blogs a week for the last year, plus a bunch of social, right? So when this thing did happen, people were aware of us, right? Like I started at 24 hour fitness as a trainer. 
the amount of clients I got by standing at the trainer station and just when I didn't have a client and I'd walk, someone would walk by me and just say, hey, I'd smile and say hi, right? And someone would eventually like, oh my God, you're so nice to me. Every time I come in, I'd love to do a session with you, right? There's your opportunity to sell. Or if you guys follow Joe Coleman, who's one of the best fitness marketers out there, like look at your DMs as your conversations. If you're putting social media content out there trying to get clients and you're putting a message out like, hey, I help return to play athletes and that's the content you're putting out there, measure the success of that content by how many people are asking you questions. How many DMs are you getting? How many people are like, damn, you help people with that or I've got that going on. What a great opportunity for us to start talking about our services to someone, right? That's the new game of digital. It doesn't just happen overnight, but that's why it's so important to understand who we are and how we help people, right? If you're not an Olympic weightlifter and someone comes to you and is like, hey, I'm really trying to get to the Olympics and I do this sport competitively, all right, could you maybe help them? Maybe you can help them right there in a setting, you can do some acute thing, whatever, right? But then you're like, yeah, but that's not who I really help them with, right? So then it turns into like, how can I help that person, right? And then you pass them off and then it returns a favor where Quinn's like, oh, I've got someone in Seattle, like they need a therapy, you know, and you start matching that value, right? But knowing where you are allows people to know what you do well, right? Like when you think about your friends, you like, if something triggers your mind, you're like, oh, Cody's a really great video editor. So anytime someone's talking about video editing, I want to find a way to like, oh yeah, one of my best friends is a video editor. He does all of T-Mobile and Google and, and, uh, Gatorade social media stuff. And they're like, oh damn, that's super. And so there's a conversation point. So finding values, finding connection, that's where it all starts. If we don't have that locked down, we're just selling sweat angels, sets and reps like everybody else, right? And now we're in a battle to where, yeah, someone's gonna buy you based on price. But if someone's looking at Quinn being like, man, I've been trying to get better at my clean and jerk and my snatch for a competition for years. And I've been dutting some bug, buggy shit in my shoulder going on and his article and doing the, the supine 90 degree angle uh, uh, lateral extension or overhead extension with a PVC pipe really helped my overhead position in the bottom of my snatch. Like, oh shit, I'm gonna go to California so I can have him work on me or assess me, right? Like he's been building that value over all this time. So, but he, because he has a value of like, yeah, I work with a shitload of Olympic weightlifters. I also Olympic weightlift. I really love Olympic weightlifting. Look at the book that I've got, right? Like that person who loves Olympic weightlifting is like, I bet that dude really loves Olympic weightlifting. I bet he's really gonna help me with my body as it relates to Olympic weightlifting, right? Like it's a very clear value proposition. So build that with your clients. What do you do? Who do you help? Why do your current clients work with you, right? Ask yourself that right now. Why do patients come to see you? And I hope the answer isn't geography, right? I hope it's, cause man, I'm the best part of their day, right? That's okay. If you're the 22 year old energetic super kid, I was that kid, right? I didn't have 10 years experience or 30 certifications under my belt or a network of people. I had, hey, I'm 22, I'm really hungry. I, love, I wanna learn everything. If I don't know the answer, I'm gonna go learn. We're gonna have a kick ass time while we're working together. Okay, if you don't have a good relationship with fitness, are you gonna be at least entertained for a couple hours a week by some kid who's like clearly does too much caffeine? Yeah, that's probably a way better version of fitness than the one you've had like, P90X in my living room, right? Like that's never worked for you. And for whatever reason, you be that person that lights that person on fire. So anyway, that's value. I get really caught up in it, apparently. Well, and people, again, people will say, well, I am now competing with everybody else on social media. Mm -hmm. And my post that I spent three hours on and I wrote up a really awesome caption and I spent an hour in Canva with the graphic design and it got seven likes and then it got pushed down the algorithm in, in an hour and now what? So, but we've, so first of all, your point of this, this doesn't happen overnight. And unfortunately in our mind, in some of our minds, it's like, well, it needs to, but there's just a reality to this situation. But if you're consistent, consistency and momentum builds. And, and it sounds like that's, that's what we're getting at here is, is one side of things. So there's no better place to start than just now. But the other side of it is the people right now listening in have past experiences interacting with humans mm -hmm. and at, in some capacity. What if you're a student or not a student? What if you're a new grad or a new trainer coach who's literally just started and you got your first client load the week before the lockdown? 
and you're like, I literally have nobody. Well, think about all the people that you touched base with in school or during your, your training, your education that were interested in this. You do have connections. And one of the examples, Sam, you said, okay, like at a soccer game with all the families in the small town, I go run out and, and help the kid with his ankle and then they see me. Well, how does that now translate to online? Well, what if you did like, a, like an online Zoom meeting with your past contacts about a, a, some type of topic that everybody's interested in? Doesn't matter what it is. You do like a, a little webinar or you do like a coaching, like a little training sesh. Yeah. You know, and, and for free, God forbid. Uh, so there are ways to do this and you do have people. Yeah. It doesn't have to be just throwing it out to the ether webs of social media for it to get like dissolved immediately, which you can still do that by the way, cause that will build momentum, but you do have a circle. And I, and I think that's a really important point to get at here. Uh, what, so a lot of the questions we're getting in, also have to do with a sudden change mm -hmm. your value your your services are perceived so let's say for example your clients are used to a gym setting an in-person brick and mortar gym setting with you there or it's a high-end boutique gym or it's not it's it's a weightlifting gym or a powerlifting gym that's dusty as hell but it's in person overnight things have shifted and you're losing clients because they don't feel that the view is the same. It, when we talk about like price points and maybe we get into the nitty here, some people are like, should, do I keep my price point the same? Yep. Lower, like what, from that perspective, not should you keep it the same or not, but what, what questions that you should ask yourself to those even are. those questions? Well, step one, we have to assess first, are we, providing for our existing clientele and our existing money stream, our, our revenue stream that supports us currently. That game you need to take care of immediately. Your current clients, your current members, your current people, find an existing system, right? Is that live Zoom workouts a couple times a day for people who can't do normal group classes? Okay, right? Is that like individualized Zoom one-on-one -on -one Skype sessions? That might be a thing too if you have that skill set. Or you might be using something where you're giving individual design, right? But you're really going to find out right now, what were you selling, right? And I know that's hard to hear because you're going to find out right now, were you selling coaching and creating a change? Or were you selling that if it's not these sets and reps or done this way, then it doesn't matter, right? And that's where we're finding people where the, the member or the patient who doesn't want to switch over to their remote experience is because they weren't sold on the experience with you, right? Like you hadn't built that value system that you were the person that's helping them. You give, you've dumped enough equity into that piggy bank of, of relationship to where that person's gonna stick with you, right? Uh, Industrial Strength, one of our, our mutual friends up there, Mira and Tony, right? Like they're obviously are an in-person gym that had to go online all of a sudden, right? And they had to figure out a solution of Instagram Live and Zoom classes online for their members. But like, holy shit, most of their members, 98% of their members stayed and are going to figure out whatever solution they do because the members are invested because they want that gym to come back to when they're done, right? So all of them are like, no, we're going to keep paying because we want this place to come home to. And that's a very different game than the coach who's experiencing like, holy shit, no one stayed with me, right? So it really came down to what were we building? What was the message that we were saying? And I think that's where value really comes into play. So first and foremost, Figure out what solution you're trying to fix. Are you, do you have something up and ready to go for your current people right now? Is that Zoom calls? Is that Skype sessions? And you have to build the value, right? Like that's just sales 101, right? Price is a factor of value. If I work with Quinn one-on-one -on -one for $250 an hour, well, I value his time and that experience for that much money. But also, but he also has a lot of other things going on. So like, okay, that means two, if 250 an hour is his training rate, well, then I bet his therapy rate or his consultate or are different rates, right? They might be higher, right? So what I'm getting at is for people, like just find the solution that works for you, right? Everybody's got a different business. I can't, I can't say that there's a Zoom calls or Skype calls or one-on-ones or just writing programming down, right? But you really have to bank on, hey, we're in this together. I'm helping you, right? It maybe it becomes a lot less, right? Overload and stress on the system from uh, external load, 
And there's probably a lot more systemic stress from just environment. Like maybe you got your three kids at home all day. So the coaching becomes like, Hey, Quinn, it, we're still on a, we're still on a fat loss journey, dude. Like we're still trying to get you down there. Like, so you being at home doesn't mean you can eat 17 bowls of raisin bran a day, right? Like you may not be under a squat rack, but that means that we got to start finding our stress in other ways, right? Like I need you doing a walk first thing in the morning. I need you doing, uh, you know, uh, you know, sit on a phone roller in the mornings. I need you to do some of your mobility drills. Like we as coaches realize that we have plenty of tools to give people. Like we're not just selling, smashing them. Right. And that's where the people who are really struggling is that's all that person knew from them was like, Oh, just go do this workout. I just show up for this workout. Right. All I'm getting is workouts. So they're valuing like, yeah, you giving me experience of like raw, raw, raw in person. Yeah. That's worth 250 bucks an hour. But like you just write the workout down at home, like that's not worth it, right? So we have to look at, well, what is that the message that our gym has been going with, right? Is that the message we're trying to do? Um, when we start moving online, when we start looking at finding new clients, when we start looking at building in this other business, we do have to make sure that we look at like, hey, remote coaching is a new business unit, right? Like let's acknowledge it. Is this something that if you wanna do this remote virtual experience, whatever you're doing, do you see yourself doing this in three to five years, right? Because if you don't see yourself doing it in three to five years, the game changes exponentially. We're doing things just to make sure we got money coming in the door. We're making members happy. We're creating an experience. But if not, we're like, okay, we see the writing on the wall that virtual is something that we all need to adopt into some level. So that why I think the game that most people are here is because we're trying to find a way to not trade the hour for the dollar, right? So it turns into how do I get some sort of passive revenue stream and sit on the beach in Bali writing programs is, is kind of the dream of what people think of when they think of remote coaching, right? Which can be a thing, but you have to look at, okay, Quinn, if I'm going to write you a program each month, well, uh, how long does it take me to write a program, right? Like, oh shit, it takes me four hours to write your program. And we do a once a month, like zoom call to kind of talk about your program, your goals for the month. And I give you individualized video feedback on every single clean and snatch that you do that you upload into true coach or, uh, and then I also give you a weekly recap where we talk about your volume. We talk about your habits. Like, oh, you spent 17 hours with that person. Uh, that, that's, you know, that's a lot of money, right? So when we start looking at the remote world, it's really easy to start putting in a lot of time. We have to understand it's not in person. It's not the same game, right? The games are entirely different. It doesn't mean that they can't play by the same rules, but now it turns into like, okay, online coaching is a scalability thing, Right. Can you have a hundred clients at 250 bucks, 300 bucks a month to where you're only spending 90 minutes to two hours a month. So that way you're making 150 bucks an hour, right? Essentially per client, right? So we know that anytime you absorb a new client or patient, that first month with them is not a cost effective month, right? That is way more work. That is way more time. Like you're hoping they just keep going right, to get to the next level. It's month two, three, and four or five to where like, okay, we know the goals. Like we, I built a system in for them to where they make it easy for me. Guys, when you get into remote coaching, we don't have the walking, like the best assessment in the world is watching our client or patient walk in the door, right? So we have to count on them giving us feedback because if we don't get feedback, we don't know what's going on, right? Because it's, as coaches, we know it's not just about the thing they do. Like if my guy comes in, he's like, oh man, my shoulder's a little tight from sleeping funny. And we had half kneeling overhead presses, but pretty heavy with a kettlebell. Well, maybe I'm gonna switch him to a landmine and he don't even know. I still got to put effort and stress in. He doesn't know that we changed, right? But like, I got the assessment on the fly. When you're in remote world, you have to build those consistencies in with your clients. You have to teach them like, hey, if you don't have a kettlebell or you don't have the weight you need or you don't have a particular implement, what do you do? Do you understand how patterns work? If I write four, two, X, zero underneath your weight, do you understand that that's a tempo? Do you understand how to read the tempo, right? Are they, like how often are clients allowed to text you back and forth, right? Like I love to be able to text my clients and talk with them and bullshit with them. So I know that I can't do a high volume game because I couldn't do a thousand clients or a hundred clients, right? I only want 10 because I want to give those 10 people everything I got, which means I need to price those 10 people at a spot that becomes valuable for my time, right? And then it turns into like, okay, it's not the same as remote. Like I'm, I don't get to spend three hours in person doing the thing with you. I've got to like, okay, I need to build in a way to get all the information I need. I need Quinn to every Monday, I need you to give me a recap about, tell me about your week. I need you to talk about how do you feel about your food choices? How do you feel about your lifting? How does the body feel? And then each day, maybe I ask you, uh, Hey Quinn, I need you to put in how many hours of sleep did you get? Uh, give me a score between one and 10 on your readiness for the day. 
how much coffee did you drink? Uh, you know, certain parameters, right? To where now that client's logging into your software or whatever you're using, and they're automatically putting in that information for you. So when you go to work on the next week's program or the, or the next set of cycle or whatever, you have all that data ready to go. You don't have to now back and forth a couple emails. Hey man, can we schedule a time? No, that time doesn't work. Oh, this time doesn't work. Oh, okay. Four hours later. Great. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Right now you're at like seven hours and you haven't even written the program yet. Right. That's where remote coaching gets really dangerous. That's where we need to start looking at our time really efficiently um, with what we're putting out there to make sure that we're on track because time now also plays a game in client acquisition. Right. Like we have to go figure out, do we have clients coming in the door? Are we giving ourselves the opportunity to sell? Are we putting ourselves in the opportunity to retain, right? We have to sell our values and our message outward. So people want to say, Hey, you might be the guy. And then we have to sell them to say, Hey, here's this experience. And then we have to say, Hey, this experience fucking rocks. Do you want to keep doing it? Right. And like, that's our marketing game. Like if you don't have leads coming in the door, you know, your marketing's not working. If you are getting leads in the door and you're not selling them, you know, your sales are messed up. If you are getting sales in the door and they're not staying past one or two months, you know there's a retention issue, right? Pull it back, where are we at? What needs to happen first? And then what do I need to start working on, right? And then how much time do I have, right? Like I get that some of you went from having a gym or a, a clinic to, and you had 12 hours a day to be at an office and work to now you're at home with a spouse and two kids that aren't super understanding as to why you're on a podcast all day or trying to write programs or whatever. So you have to figure it out. So you have to now really be attentive to your time and what you're putting in and where you're putting, you know, like you don't have 17 hours to write programs for people. So you're like, okay, but I've got 50 patients who said they want to stay on board and they still want fitness in some way. I only have 10 hours. I can really squeeze out of work right now based on my current situation. What can I give them at 10 hours a month that matches the $50 of value that ma matches my brand. Right? So maybe it comes into like, Hey guys, we have, I'm going to get to, two live workouts because that gets me moving around for fun. And then uh, I'm going to have you set up in true coach. I'm going to email you and I'm going to have, um, you know, we all have uh, goals. Like you have your, your movement or, or you have your fitness goal or you have your uh, rehab goal and we're still going to be progressing towards that. So I need you to, you know, in, you need to check the boxes. You need to submit feedback for me. I need a video for whatever that looks like, right? You need to make sure that they're accountable too, right? Like, just like you work with an in-person patient, you don't let them go to McDonald's right after and then like F off the rest of the day. Like, hey man, like I need you to go on a walk after dinner. Like I need you to like drink a glass of water before you come in the lift and not drink 19 pots of coffee a day, right? Like, so we have to, we have to be authoritative. Like if you're Zoom calling and you're like doing a Zoom coaching session, I need to say, hey Quinn, can you actually move the, mic, the, the screen down so I can see your lovely face a little bit better? Thanks, that'd be great, right? Like we have to know, like, we have to give them that experience. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're digesting this experience and you're on the other side and like, and I'm uh, talking to Quinn and I'm like, yeah, you know, like, um, so like, you know, like, what do you have in your house? Like, um, you know, like we might be able to do some stuff and, um, versus like, all right, Quinn, I know this sucks. We're both in our house. I can hear your kid running behind you. It's not ideal. We've got to figure out a way to still make sure that we get that hip right. So when we come out of this, we're able to pick right back up. We need to find some time for you to be able to get some nice volume into that left hip, into some extension. We're going to work on some of those single leg glute bridges, maybe some uh, isolated hamstring curls, whatever. Um, can we find 10 minutes in the morning to get this done? Great. Okay. And so now you're coaching, right? Like, that's the ultimate version of what a coach is, is someone who's guiding and leading. So I think if we take ownership of that role, that's who we are. That's what we're really helping our clients do. That's what's going to keep them going from like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this experience with you to like, no, I love you. I want to support you, right? Like I, I haven't trained in since 2014 full time, but I know immediately I'm like, oh shit, if this happened to me as a coach, I can name five clients right now that would have let me come live with them, right? Like, oh, because I don't have any money coming in the door. They'd have been like, no, come here. Here, come hang, right? Like, ugh. obviously they're like, yeah, I'm having my personal trainer come live with me. Like, that's probably their best move, right? But like, to have that relationship to know, like, that's a very different ball game, right? Because they do it not because, like, yeah, do they love that I power lift? Do they love that they do it? Yeah, but they also love the other elements about life and they love the interaction. Because if you don't like hanging out with someone, are you gonna spend an hour with them, right? And if you really don't like someone, are you going to want to talk to them on a digital interface where you don't even like being on a digital interface? Like coaches forget that most clients don't like doing this. 
some people don't have jobs that rely on this kind of communication or being on social media. So asking your client to video them doing a squat might be really tough, right? So we have to look at like, okay, are we building an experience that helps get them to fall in line with what we need, right? And that comes in from understanding our values, understanding what our business looks like and how we're reaching people, how we're communicating with people and how we can ultimately help them get from A to B. And then it becomes never about, is it online or in person? It just becomes like, you're my guy. That's what I'm paying for. I'm paying for your services and your brain. Through my experience in this whole situation, I've, I've done the gamut. I've kept clients who didn't even question the trans. It's like, oh, yeah, this really sucks. All right, what's the plan? You know, it was, it was, there was no question. And I've had clients who did question, but with a little education, there was a light bulb moment. So a lot of what I have experienced is there is an assumption that different is valuable. So my client now can't go to a gym. They don't have a home gym. They were relying on, you know, another gym, weightlifting gym, 24 hour, whatever it was they were training at. They have that now. Oh, then Quinn's service is not as valuable. It, there was an implication because there was an abrupt change. Mm -hmm. But now it was, no, 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 we can actually maintain your fitness and it's imperative. Like, what's the choice here? Nothing. So it's, it's imperative that we, like, yeah, it's not going to be optimal. You're not going to PR your snatch by doing air goblet squats, you know, with, get, with a back hook back squats or whatever it is, but I can, I can guide you through that process. We can maximize training right now. Mm -hmm. And there's this like, Oh, okay. and it's the same with, with tele. Again, it's an assumption that, Oh, we can't come to clinic. Now we can't provide this service. That's not necessarily true. And this is where Sam is getting at. Like, that's where your value comes in, but you have to educate on that value and you have to show them and you have to, you have to let them know that you understand their, their problem and their, and their implicit confusion, which is ultimately what it is and how you can, you can reframe that. Um, and you still might lose people. You know, I, so I, I still lost people. Uh, but, but yeah, so it's, it's like what it's what you're saying. I, I love when you said, let's, you bring it back. Where am I now? Who do I have? How, can I take care of these people? Because if we forget about them and we, we try to get new people and then we got people who are dropping off the back end, that's the worst possible scenario because your marketing is going to be shit because you're pushing your, you're pushing your wallet into other people's pants. Like you said, that was, I love that. Um, and you're not, and so you're like the, the candles burning on both ends, right? So it's like, you take care of your people. What can I do for you? How can we solve your problems? right now or this whole situation like how can we clean this up and make sure there's a plan go are we cool you're on board with that awesome and then that's the platform that we can build off of right uh, well if i can expand too you know we, we acknowledge that personal training is a boutique service right it is something that people and, and especially like uh maybe some uh consistent therapy uh from clinicians like that's a boutique thing right like if I can, like, I'm going to get manual therapy every chance I get because I love it, right? It just feels good, right? So, uh, but like if shit hits the fan, like it's probably something I'm going to cut. But also we can say that like we know that there's a specific type of person that falls into that category, right? That's going to pay for those types of services, right? Like you're not going to go, you're not going to go start a boutique fitness facility in the projects, right? Because your demographic isn't very good, right? So if we look at it like Whole Foods, and uh, Safeway, Randall's, whatever, mid like grocery store, they both sell steak, they both sell prime ribeyes, right? Which one's more valuable? Which one's better tasting, right? Like you can make some arguments on both sides. Marketing can say a lot of things about the corn fed one, blah, 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 and the grass fed, organic, right? But it's all perception, right? Do, when I, do I inherently look at like that $49 ribeye as like it probably, it's got better color, it looks a little nicer than the $17 ribeye? Right? Like, yeah. Do, are they inherently going to have a lot of different tastes? Maybe, right? It's how you dress it up. What else goes with it? Right? So we know as coaches, people who are going to be buying personal training are not people who are spending, like are worried about 20 bucks, right? Like we cannot make this a race to the bottom because it's going to crush the industry, right? What's going to happen right now, guys. And I'm telling you this, you're going to see it right now is holy shit. I don't have clients. And everybody starts rolling back their prices like they're Walmart. And next thing you know, you're like, I've got 97 clients paying me $7.99 a month for three, three workout videos a day. What? Like, 
holy shit, you're, you're, the amount of hours you have to put in for the, like, you're done. Like, it's going to smoke you, right? Versus, all right, if we know that that steak from Whole Foods, like, yeah, that, that, that's got a little bit different market appeal. Someone who's like, if they're caring about like, oh, yeah, I want to buy a nice piece of meat, right? Then $49 is not going to scare them versus 17 So go be that trainer, right? Show that you have value. Like, hey, I've, this is what I've been through. This is what I've got. This is what I got going, right? Like, inherently, if you're next to someone that's selling $29.99 programs, let's say, just say internet neighbors, and then you're selling $49 programs, right? Well, do you want your message to look like the, the low value, just like everything? No, because you're playing their game. You're playing the Planet Fitness game, right? Planet Fitness makes money because they bank on people not coming in to wear their equipment out, right? Because it's 10 bucks a month, right? Which is a great model, right? You can't play that game. You are not a large volume business, right? Scale back the amount of offerings you have and deliver higher value per signature, per, per individual business offering, right? So if that's individual, individual design, like, hey, you're going to get a kick-ass experience. Quinn, you're going to get a 30-minute phone call every week. You're going to get daily recaps of your workouts. You're going to get live video feedback, uh, coaching, to where it's going to be me watching your video, screencast, coaching your lifting, drawing some pictures, right? Like, holy shit, that's really valuable because you have a home gym set up at home. Yeah, that's probably worth 350 bucks a month, right? Like, you know, I'm just making up a price, but like that, that has a lot of value. You're, you can now charge a nice value for that because look at what they're getting right? They have a home gym set up. You're giving them the same programming they would get. You're giving them like, Hey, I need you to film your clean, but then you're going in there like, Hey Sam, I need you to do this, this, and this, right? You need to get up on your toes more through that, through that last drive. Uh, and it's like, Oh shit. It feels like Quinn's here, right? Is it the best thing? Cause I'm not next door to him. No, but it still feels like he's coaching me and the price, like it still feels at a price that's valuable. Cause it's like, wow, I'm getting four workouts a week with direct coaching. Whereas before I was only getting like one individual session, just working on my snatch right? Like, oh, now I can work with him for 350 bucks a month instead of 500 uh, once a month. And I get so much more value, right? Like we can also look at like the remote coach, the remote client, it might, it's probably going to look different than uh, the in-person client, right? Like if you have someone that you have to teach how to squat, how to hinge, how to push, how to press, how to rotate, how to move, that's going to take your ability to now start, oh, how do I make that easy for them? right? How do I get grandma Betty to understand what the frick a dead bug is, right? And then are you good enough at explaining it? So, okay, I need you to get down on your hands and knees. I need your wrists underneath your elbows, your elbows underneath your shoulders. And I need you to alternate between lifting one hand and what, whatever it is. But you realize, holy shit, to shoot that video, to write that cat, like that takes a lot of time, right? Not that you shouldn't have those videos or you probably should have those videos now anyway, or work towards them. But that's a very, really big time suck. So you're like, okay, I'm not ready to install that kind of offering quite yet. What can I, you know, what, what matches what I have going on right now, right? Like we have to honor the time. We have to honor the value and match the value to what we can. And that's how we make sure we stay out of the no man's land of just charging a discount rate for a shitload of work. And that, that's a, a key point to kind of hone in on right now for all those brick and mortars that are struggling. That, I mean, it's a little late to, to do this, but you need to reach out to all your current clients and be like, it, we're going to be okay. Like, and gonna, Pat. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, uh, first thing I did was I messaged every client and I said, we're going to, we're going to be all right. Like I've, I've got a plan. We're going to start, this is what we're doing yep. gonna, and it's going to start now. Yeah. Um, if you haven't done that, you need to do it now. And then from there, you know, like he's talking about find something that's going to work for you and work for your people and implement as, as quickly as possible, just to get the ball rolling. You don't mm -hmm. have to reinvent the wheel right now. We're not telling you to create an entire system of, newsletters and emails and, and all the other stuff like just pick up zoom pick up skype pick up something message your clients and say hey look i mean calendly or uh what, what's the other schedule Ready? yeah anything like that just start an account it's free get on zoom it's free and and start telling them hey you can book with me half an hour here half an hour there Let, let's get going and, and just just start making it work and you'll, you'll figure it out and Right now, with the way the situation is, people are going to, it's going to be awkward. They're going to come on. They're not going to know how to start the audio. They're going to be, you're staring at a black screen for a while and everybody's going to try to like, oh, I don't understand what this whole thing is. We're all going to fumble through it a little bit. And that, that it's going to be endearing, honestly. They're going to look at it and it's going to be a memory and you can all laugh about it you know, six months down the road, hopefully when the dust settles. Yeah. But start now. Start now so you can start to, to keep that 
that value high because if you wait another week, if you wait another two weeks, they're going to be gone. Yep. And I think you need to act like you're, and I know everybody's in different situations, so I don't want to sound like a dick when I say this, but we have to act like we want to be in this when this thing's done, right? Like, don't act like it's done and you're going to be done if you don't do this thing, right? Like, all right, like maybe shit's not good right now. Maybe stuff's really tough, but you bet your life on being a trainer or a physical therapist or whatever. Like, yeah, there's no other option. I'm coming out of this and still going to be the thing. Like, that's what I want to do to where now it turns into like, yeah, it sucks. What can we do to sharpen our blade right now? What can we learn, right? Oh, I don't know shit about that digital marketing stuff Sam was talking about. I need to go learn about digital marketing, right? Great. YouTube, Udemy, somewhere, right? Read my blog. Like we, we have ways to learn, right? But now it turns into like, okay, maybe you don't have a digital experience yet. Maybe you like just got your clients, your members to like, all right, you got 20 of your 40 members doing something. You got something coming in the door. You're getting reps in, right? You're getting practice, right? We talk about content. Like, you know, I'm a big baseball guy. Baseball is my uh, a big passion for me. And like, so Eric Cressy is a, a big mentor for me. And like, let's not forget that Eric's put out a blog post about the shoulder where baseball players were throwing sport athletes every day for like 15 years. That's why he's Eric Cressy, right? It did not happen overnight, right? He's had to put out content consistently. So use this time to condition your current clients to maybe go to your blog because you're going to write a weekly blog because you have time. Or, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a monthly newsletter. I would love it if you guys would all share it with your coworkers, your friends. Like, like guys, your, all your clients have coworkers, right? Who may or may not be working with a trainer, right? So just because you don't have people right now, start within the network. Like spider, I'm a big handshake kiss baby guy, right? Like start with the spider web. Like, oh, Jerry, like you work here. Like, oh, bring a friend, right? Like start it small, getting people to come join you. Invite people in is a great way to start getting people to do this. Um, but yeah, really starting to figure out, uh, so I just lost my train of thought on that. Um, but how to, how to hone this all in and how to get uh, people in the door, right? And how to make sure that you're consistently understanding, like if I wanna be in this later, right? Like what can I do now? Maybe I can start that blog. Maybe I can get that newsletter. Maybe you're thinking about remote coaching. None of your clients want to remote coach with you, right? They're just like, it's not worth the money. Great. All right. Maybe you got three clients that you've just really enjoyed. They just have a good relationship. They've never been laid on whatever. And it's like, Hey Quinn, uh, this obviously is changing the way my business looks right now. We've had a pretty good relationship. Um, I need to scale my business and learn about remote coaching. Would it be okay if I demoed on you over the next eight weeks? Uh, in exchange, I'm just going to ask for you to uh, maybe write a testimonial about your experience, good or bad. I want the experience. Uh, and then just to go through the experience with me uh, and then practice right? Like if none of your clients wanted to do the remote thing right now and you're not doing it at all, well, get someone to do it as a practice round so you can work out the kinks, right? Like how good were you guys with your first patient? Uh, right? Like if I, I know if I watched my session when I was a 21 year old, I'm like, I'd look at that guy and be like, oh God, get him out of this industry. Jesus. Right? Like I would hate myself, but we should, right? Because it's ourselves. It's what we've learned, right? But like use this time to get better. All right. No one came over with me yet. What is that telling me? That's telling me that I'm not offering a service that's of value to the money I'm asking. Well, how do I make the experience more valuable, right? Price is only a factor of value, right? We all love to spend money. If you have extra money in your pocket, what do you want to spend on? Some people love coaching. Some people love food. Some people love electronics. Some people like, like we all love to spend money, right? And so it turns out like, don't think that people don't want to spend it. You just need to have a value proposition that hits them like, yeah, I am tired of hurting. I am tired of my snatch not being where I want it to be. I am tired of not being able to pick up my grandkids. I am tired of feeling like low energy all the time. I want to do something about it. God, I really enjoyed that guy's content. Oh, okay. I want to do the same, right? Like consistently build trust consistently work on what can you be doing right now to move the needle forward that adds value. And if that's not money directly coming in the door, well, then you sure as heck better be going out and getting experience, right? Go get your F ups now. So you know what the message looks like later. So when you need to refine it, you know where your mishaps are like, Ooh, it's really like, okay, I really forget to do the, ch the weekly check-ins are kind of tough for me. That means I need to set up a thing on Sundays. I sit down at 9am and drink my coffee and do all my client check-ins, whatever, right? Like, we are going through a period right now where we really need to level up. We have some new skills we really need to develop. 
we have a business that got turned on its head and we kind of, we're really going to be forced to rise to the occasion, right? Like the people who rise to this, the people who are able to come out of this when this is done are going to be in a great spot, right? It's going to be tough though, right? And I don't want to sugarcoat it and say it's going to be rainbows and butterflies and super easy and say, if you believe it, you can do it because you can't. You have to put the work in. You have to figure out like, what can I do to push the needle forward right now? Do I start that blog, right? Do I start that YouTube channel? Do I start posting on social media regularly? Do I, right, start building this online program I've been thinking about, right? Like, yeah, your business might have crapped out on you too because no one wanted to come over, but like, that doesn't mean you stop. You still have to switch over. Or you have to take a deep look and say, why did no one switch over? What do I need to do to adjust that experience, right? Because that's, the business never lies, right? Like if, if no one came over, that tells me you weren't creating an experience that, that did it, right? So we have to adjust that experience and own that, all right, that wasn't good. What do I need to do? Was that person just not feeling it? Like Quinn had to educate some of his clients. What's the education you got to give to get people to say, all right, I want to work with John. I want John to do the stuff with me at home or whatever that looks like, right? That's the game we're now playing. I think that's a great, that's a great way to end. Um, Joe, this has been awesome, Sam. I mean, so much info. I'm going to, so people, you will get to the recording because we always get questions about that. And I'll, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Watch the recording, watch it again, watch it again. It's like reading a book, watching a movie. You always pick on something, you know, pick up something new. There are a lot of hidden nuggets in what Sam has been saying. And there's a lot of different ways. Like, you know, you're going to say, well, my situation is different because X, Y, Z. <laughs> we, we could all say that. Yeah, your situation is different because you're not me and I'm not you and you, you don't live in the same place or have the same house. So like, yes, we're all different, but these principles are, are relatively universal. Mm -hmm. And if, yeah, truly something doesn't apply to you, then fine, you can filter that out. But the vast majority of it will, and it's about impl the implementation is a process, is an iter iterative process over time that you're always fine tuning. Yeah. Um, Alex asked a good question, I think, yeah. to summarize. He, he, so you mentioned, Sam, a, a trainer who was very, very good in the marketing space, the digital uh -huh. marketing space. Can you repeat the name of that person and also any other good resources that you can think of for marketing, particularly for, yeah. well, Alex asked particularly for boutique high-end clinics, but anything really kind of in the space that we're talking about? Totally. Uh, from a social media standpoint, guys, I think that Jill Coleman doesn't, excellent job with social media coaching uh, and marketing. Joel? Jill, sorry, Jill. Jill, Jill, sorry, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jill Coleman, uh, and uh, she's out in LA, and she, like, I just took her uh, Instagram story course, and, like, I work for a, a large business doing marketing, right? And, like, she has great things to say, and she was the one who really reframed it to me to look at the DMs as conversations, right? Sometimes you look at dumb questions like, oh, shit, really, another dumb question? It's like, no, that person's blatantly making themselves open and available to you to give them feedback. They're giving you the opportunity to sell them, right? Um, so Jill Coleman is one of my favorites. Um, the Business for Unicorns from Mark Fisher and Michael Keeler is one of my absolute favorite business mentorship groups. Um, oh, I forget, Gym Breakthrough with Marcus Gersey uh, is a great gym uh, clinic uh, box uh, resource for marketing. Um, Ready, Aim, Fire is a book that I really enjoy, uh, just about startups and business. Um, Culture Code by Daniel Coyle was a great book. Uh, just really looking at um, uh, how teams operate, right? And how to harness a group, right? Inevitably, we all need people to help us. And then his other book, uh, Talent Code, which is kind of an individual base, is really good. Um, Man, what else do I got? I'm a big, Atomic Habits. Uh, I'm a big reader, so uh, yeah, Atomic Habits is a great one. Steal the Show. If you're not a public speaker or you're not good at driving meetings or jumping on and doing ad hoc talking, Steal the Show is a great book uh, by a guy named Chris Port, who was a, a he's, who's an actor and started a public. He has a book on public speaking, and then they have a public speaking school. Um, I was actually supposed to be at their public speaking school last week, but obviously that got shut down. Uh, but, you know, uh, great resources. And so uh, I would encourage you uh, to look at what areas do you feel like you're most lacking? And I think for a lot of us coaches that 
Um, we love fitness. We love to nerd out on fascia and joints and tissue and performance and physiology. The downfall is, is we somehow have to translate uh, helping someone achieve better internal rotation through better hip adduction and give that to a client is like, yeah, that's going to make your butt look good in those jeans or that's going to help your low back not hurt, right? Like the translation is really tough. So is, are our clients buying better, are serratus moving more free? Yeah, they are, but they're, they're buying it so they can put their own bra on. They're buying it so they can put their seatbelt on without pain, right? So it really turns into like, do we need to keep going deeper down the anatomy hole all the time with our clients? And I think that's a huge miss with, with communicating, whether it's a, a, a clinician or a trainer that we don't want to come on top of these people and make them feel dumb for not knowing the answer. We need to make them feel good about where they are at and what they are doing, right? And how we can help them. And I think that's a huge miss. If someone comes in, that's just like, and I used to do this. That's why I say it is like, I just want to tone. I want to like do like toning exercises. And if I jump in, like, are you stupid? It is 2020. How can you be on the toning thing? We are so off that the toning thing is even real. Did you not hear that linear periodization, mechanical stress and lifting heavy weights is going to not make you bulky and going to make you the woman that you want to be? Uh, I don't want to do this versus like totally get it. I completely understand not wanting to jump into some of the technical lifts. They're really scary. We don't actually put, I don't put anybody into things they aren't comfortable with. We'll totally scale to your skill set. Don't worry about it. The great thing is we really value our coaching and we really value making sure our clients feel safe in what they're doing, whether that's from a remote setting or an in-person setting. The big thing is, is that you feel confident in the gym because I recognize Quinn that you're not going to be here working with me my entire, your entire life. So if anything, I want to empower you with the information to go forward, right? Like guys, a big mistake too. Like Let's not think that people are going to learn everything we know in a session, right? Like, um, although I, I take that back, I, I took uh, clinical weightlifting a couple years ago uh, and I've actually been teaching it ad hoc for the last few years uh, just on my own because I know it so well because I took it once. Like we're not going to learn information in one go, right? Don't act like giving away free information to your clients. They're going to take with it and run it and become trainers, right? If anything, they're just like, oh, that's cool, right? Great, right? And it gives them the tools to talk to their clients and their, or their, their friends about it. Right. Like I, when I was a trainer, I had one guy, one woman turn into nine clients that all trained three days a week. Right. Because it started off with just like communicating and talking. And all of a sudden you start infiltrating the family and you start getting to know them. Right. And it becomes this person, this person, this person. And you, like when you show up to a family barbecue, everybody's like, Oh, you're Sam. I've been hearing so much about you. I've been meaning to call you. Right. And then when you're right there, they can't say no to you. Right. Cause you've been right there. They know all the stories. Oh, yeah, Ellie's been telling me about the sled and the sled, the thing, the sled that she just does. And I'm like, so there's already a running joke, right? That brand new person's got a running inside joke that me and my client have. That person's ready to buy sessions from you, right? They're, that person's literally telling you like, I want to get my ass handed to me on the sled because I want to be like Ellie, right? Like, so you giving your clients the tools to know how to talk about you is really fun, right? It also gives them a narrative so that way you're an ongoing thing in your life. And I think that's something Jill did really well in her marketing course was involving people. I live in this spot in Boulder where I have a great uh, view of the flat irons. But when I moved in, there was a huge hole in the ground in front of me because there was an apartment going up. And so for the last 18 months, every morning I kind of do a pan of the, the skyline because you see the flat irons. But now 18 months later, there's a three story apartment in front of it. So it's been like, everybody's been included though that like from social media, they've gotten to follow along my life. I've gotten to pull back the layer and they see what I get to do with my life. And it allows a little bit more connection, right? It inspires a way to have that conversation, right? So as we talk about this, just to kind of tie it all together, bringing the marketing in, tying, starting conversations, getting people to understand your values, what you do, who you are, is a great way to start bringing people into this, this revenue stream, this business that you're trying to start. Uh, and not only does it going to bring people in to buy your services, but it's also going to be the reason why people stay. And it's also going to be the reason why people talk about you. Because business 101, referrals are the cheapest lead you can get, right? Whether you're on Facebook or Instagram, whatever, like the, the referral is your most profitable lead, right? So that's the one you need to go after. So for those of you who are wondering how to do Facebook ads and start social media, learn about it. Do everything you can to learn about it. Start following accounts and look at who's doing it really well. I think Achieve Fitness Boston, Achieve Fitness Boston is the best Instagram on the planet for fitness. I think they just do a kick-ass job. Jason and Lauren Pack. 
Uh, and they just do a really fun way to get people involved in understanding exercise. And they've just been consistently doing it. Um, learn from the people that you admire, learn from the brands that you like, what brands, like if you have ever sat down or worked with a graphic designer and you want to create a logo, they're going to ask you, Hey, I need you to give me five brands that you really like five brands that you don't like. Tell me why on each. Right? So to use your time to do that. What are the people that you really like who maybe play in your space that do social media well, or do blog really well, or do email really well, go look at what they're doing. What are they doing? Well, why do you like it? Would you buy it? What are they doing? What would you do different? How do you, that's like, don't try to reinvent the wheel with your marketing, right? The systems are built, right? You do have to be unique. You do have to have your own spin, but that's part of your value system, right? If you look at content these days, it's very unique around having this unique spin to it. Like I love this podcast called hot ones where they interview celebrities, where they have to eat a chicken wing and every question is a wing and that progressively gets hotter. Right. And so by the end, they have like the billion Scoville unit pepper one. And, but he, I mean, you got like Kevin Hart and Shaq and like Scarlett Johansson and it's, and he's a great interviewer, but it's like, it's funny. There's so, there's a stick to it. Right. Watching someone interview someone on TV is not new. Right. Howard Stern, Shay Leno. Right. Um, obviously, uh, more before that, right? But that's a, it's not a new thing, but that's a new spin on the same thing, right? So, or do you have a new message? If you have a new message, that's entirely different. Or if you want to be on a message, that's a very different, right? Like if you want to be, um, you know, have, uh, let's just say, uh, Dr. Pat Davidson, like, and it's like the foundational four, like do these things or, or, uh, you know, you have a, a methodology, this is the only, this is the only rule, then you have to be unapologetic about going down that hole, right? Or if you're an FRC guy or you're a animal or FMS or whatever, like be that person, go down it. Now have a unique spin on it or have a unique take on it or have a value that's different than the way someone else looks on it. That's where your individually come, individuality comes out, but you're not going to, don't worry about trying to change the game of marketing. Don't try to be super cute with your, your training name or your whatever, right? It's not an aim screen name right? We're looking at finding a business that helps connect with people, right? And so look at what you have to offer those people. And that's where we're going to start really going at it with our marketing message, right? Um, and making it super simple. So yeah, Joe Coleman, great resource, figure out the spot that you're really weak in, start sharpening that sword, start practicing the experience, right? Get a couple of your clients to go through a remote coaching experience with you. So you can learn about what it would take to give them a Hey, what would it take to give you a $500 a month experience, right? Learn that like, Oh yeah, I would love this. And they start playing with it, right? Do it with your clients that already love you. That's someone who doesn't necessarily want to keep paying you right now, but like you get a lot of value with that person's a great candidate to do a new experience with because they're so conditioned with you and they already know how to move that like, okay, they're willing to go through those aches and pains because they like you, right? Everybody's heads got turned on flipped upside down. It's not like you're the only one. Everybody's sitting on zoom for the first time. Everybody's quarantined right? Everybody's realizes that you're not going to have a perfect system. You're not going to have a perfect setup, but do it where you look like you, you literally, you, you can't like, it may not be perfect, but if you know someone worked really hard to make sure they gave you a shitload of value, right? Like you're not going to care as much, right? Like, so, you know, you really, um, you know, really want to make sure that you're delivering value across the board and finding how, what areas you need to get better at so you can add the most value, right? So use this time, go through these resources, find where you can sharpen your tool and find out what you can do better and then start practicing, getting better at each little thing and uh, learn, like learning, right? Trial by fire, right? Like as much as like, I want to say I learned all this years ago, it's been like through an experience of 12 years in the industry, or what year is it, 2020? Uh, yeah, 12 years in the industry of like getting into this and like learning. Right. Like, sure. I went to school in business, but like I had to learn the fitness side quickly. Right. And then it's like, Oh, okay. I'm in the fitness side, but like, okay, I might have better understanding of business, but like I digital marketing, the internet really wasn't a thing that when I was in college, like my parents had dial up till I was a junior in college. So it's not like, I, you know, I grew up with Snapchat and aim and these things. So I had to learn this new evolution. I just had to put all my eggs into it for a longer time. Right. So which one do you need to work on right now? Use this time to work on that if you know that you want to come out of this experience as a coach, as a clinician, right? And say like, okay, this is not an awesome scenario. I clearly shows me I was not prepared. What can I do to make sure I'm prepared for the next round? What things do I need to take on? Marketing is a big piece, 
right? Like if you guys aren't reading a marketing piece once a month, uh, like you're mi missing the boat, right? Like if that's the thing that you don't know, you probably need to double up on marketing and Seth Godin and, and other marketing assets than you do another physiology textbook. And I don't mean to discredit the world of coaching, right? Or what we do as professionals, guys, like I very much honor that. I try to take a course once a month and I've done so for the last five years, right? Like I very much, I very much appreciate continuing education, but you got to look at what's the thing I don't do well, right? I take more in-person uh, fitness certifications because I'm weaker in that in, than I am in, in the business side, right? So I'd rather spend more time taking, you know, I'd, I'd love to take Quinn's course three times a year, right? And just continually refine that, right? Because that's the best part about taking courses over is you get to relearn. So uh, yeah, I hope this was helpful. I know I'm really long-winded, but I hope you guys found some value in it and, and uh, understand that big thing, guys, take a breath, right? Serve the people that are paying your bills now, serve the people that you're already serving your community, and then worry about building the next business and worry, like take a breath and say, what is it that I'm trying to do? Is it something I see myself doing for a while? How do I start building in the pieces to make sure that it actually fits with me successfully? Because doing something like a podcast, when you've got three kids at home and a clinic and a gym and a, a online coaching business, that's, it's a lot of work, right? So a podcast probably isn't your best friend when you have very limited time versus a monthly newsletter. That might be an okay thing for what you have going on right now. Right? So match your, match your efforts to the time you have. Don't feel guilty about what you can't do. Worry about moving the needle forward. Right? If that's doing 20 minutes of this or 30 minutes of this, uh, I'm a big, I keep a box of poster board uh, in my work area uh, because I'm a big picture thinker. And if you can see, like it's up, I have it all over my apartment, just poster boards of projects that I'm working on. So that way I know if I've thought about it, I can look up to my computer like, oh, okay. And if I haven't thought about it, I can go write it down and I can look up and say, oh, okay, I've thought about that thought on that topic. It's there. I don't need to hold on to it anymore. I think of it very much like this is super dorky, uh, like Harry Potter, where uh, Dumbledore takes the freaking thought out of his brain and puts it in the bowl for you to look at. Like I very much look at the poster board like that for me to where I know I've already processed that idea, put it up there. Great. I've acknowledged it. Now I can go back to what I'm doing because I think we get caught up like, Oh, that's such a good idea. I will remember that. And then you're like, uh, I'm really thirsty, right? Like you just, you don't, right? And it's, it's allowed me a productivity level that's allowed me to not feel trapped by planning because I'm not a planner. I'm kind of erratic. And so um, to feel like I've got everything kind of figured out without um, overwhelmed by how much shit's in my brain, as you can tell how many tangents I go on, my brain's kind of just this. Um, so it gives me big picture time to think and plan time to plan and look at where I need to go from here. Look, I, I wanna just have everybody appreciate the fact that I realized you were standing up this entire time. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't be able to hold me up. Your cardio is something else. You've been standing and talking like this for an hour and a half, my man. <laughs> just, I would die, I'd have fallen over already. That's the power lift for me, I'd have been done. I'd have like put, put me off to the side somewhere, let me breathe. Um, this is my superpower. Social bandwidth is my superpower. Uh, uh, yeah, I believe it 100%. Do you actually recall the name of that course from Jill Coleman? Yeah, it's called Story You. Story You. Okay. I don't know if it's an evergreen thing for her, um, but I've been plugging it enough that I think that she probably is going to want to do it. It's, it was great. It was like um, 27 bucks, right? Like, oh, it was yeah. That, there you go. Just did it over, over Instagram, or, or, or sorry, over Zoom. Uh, but it was a great way to look at social media. And honestly, like, I'm, I do the video thing all the time. I do this, this kind of thing like three, four times a day, right? A video call, Zoom podcast kind of thing. And I do it week in, week out. Um, style, man. What I enjoy doing, right? And on it, I had three trips that I did 30 days or longer each, right? Like just bouncing around the country, doing podcasts, hanging out, chatting with people. But it's what I really love to do. And it matches, um, you know, who I am. Um, sorry, what was your last question? No, that was it. That's just, that's my style too. Oh, yeah. The, the video stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's reps, 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 reps. That's it. it takes. Right? Like, I get that I can just jump on and do this, right? Like, and just talk for an hour and a half ad hoc. But, like, it's also, like, I know this. Like, I, this is my day job. I consult with people all day and do this. I talk about it all day. You know what I mean? Like, I, that's what you guys should be with your coaching, right? Like, five years ahead of who you're working with, right? Like, is Quinn, work, is Quinn Stu McGill's 
uh, physical therapist? Not probably not. Like not because Quinn's not smart enough to do it, but like I I, I wouldn't want to be Stu McGill's. You know what I mean? Like is that the audience that you're really going after? Is that the real thing that you're really trying to get? Um, yeah, really focusing on you know who we're trying to help and and uh, locking into that. Sam, where can people connect with you and learn more about what you're doing? Uh, learn about True Coach because we so just a disclaimer here. John, Jared, and myself all use True Coach as a platform. This was not a, we didn't talk about True Coach. We love True Coach because of its functionality and what you guys have been doing. Um, and, and so we're advocates of, of the program. But, you, you know, as far as what you use when the rubber hits the road, you know, that's your choice. You just figure out what platform you want to use. But obviously, these principles, like True Coach has a brand and what Sam has been espousing here are valuable and so where can they connect with you, Sam, learn more about what you're doing, uh, learn more about, you know, true coach ins and outs and, and all that stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, truecoach.co.co. I know like I have to end every email, <laughs> not um, right. Cause then someone's like, I sent you an email. What the hell? Uh, nope.co, uh, truecoach.co. We've extended our trial to 30 days long. You don't have to put a credit card in, jump in, sign up, just play around, make yourself as one of your clients, use a separate email and just digest your own workout through True Coach, right? So the client's gonna digest the workout through an app, right? You're building it on your computer, it's video driven, you can put your own videos in, or we have videos already in there, um, and just go through it. But yeah, truecoach.co. Uh, I also write a business, uh, or I, I write a blog uh, for True Coach, and so if you go to True Coach and hit the blog button, and I mostly write business and business development and marketing articles. I don't really love talking about why your glenohumeral gliding needs to be X amount of degrees for you to reach maximal overhead position. I mean, it's cool. Like there, but the people who write that way are way better at it than I am. And they, they actually enjoy it. Uh, I don't enjoy it. So I write articles like five ways to get more clients. that's not using social media and eight ways to build a six figure coaching business. Um, so yeah, a ton of content there. If you go to our YouTube channel, I've done a ton of interviews with different experts in the industry on remote coaching. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about remote coaching, I did one with Michael Bond uh, over at big dogs, uh, which is part of OPEX. That guy has 150 individual remote clients by himself. Right. And he's like nine minutes per client. You know, it's pretty, it's executed and he delivers consistency. It's great. Uh, it's, and it's a great service. So great one to learn from someone who does that as their job. Uh, I have a podcast called fitness break room. Uh, Mr. Hennick's been on it. Uh, I just tell the stories about how fitness professionals and athletes got to where they are. Like, I want to know how you broke your elbow and that's how you ended up being an intern. Or I want to know how you battled with binge eating and that's why you want to help, you know, people with binge eating, right? Like, that's what I want people to know because this industry isn't rainbows and unicorns out of the gate. It's hard as shit, right? Like, you're going to take some haymakers to the jaw and it sucks and I'm sorry, but all of us that have been in here like, oh yeah, I remember that one, right? Like you all remember that lesson. This is, COVID's gonna be a big lesson for us. Um, but I wanna tell the stories about that people have been through it just like everybody else, right? Like Mike Bledsoe was sleeping on a mattress in a gym because he couldn't afford rent in an apartment and CrossFit Memphis when he started it up. So for three years, he had a mini fridge and a blender, right? Like, oh yeah, now you know him as like Mike Bledsoe with the Barbell Shrug podcast and you know all the things, but you're like, oh damn, that's a whole new appreciation for people. Right, just like when I was talking about people uh, connecting, right, and like finding that. So, uh, Fitness Break Room uh, is my podcast. Uh, you can find me at sampogue.com, uh, and then Instagram is the social media channel that I'm on the most. S P O G U E eight uh, six. It's mostly fitness content. I don't really post a lot of fitness business marketing content outside of the True Coach blog, uh, but I, I'm battling with starting. I too resist against uh, doing this. Uh, I do this all day for true coach, but like I do this zero on my own channel, right? Like I could have the best of the best fitness uh, interviews on Instagram and I, I just don't do it because I do it all the time for work. So I get it. Like I resist doing social media as well and stepping into that because I just, I do it for work and I don't want to do it when I get home essentially, right? Even though I'm home, home all day right now. So I get, I understand guys, it's hard. Um, but yeah, I try to put out a lot of content when I'm reading, personal development stuff um, and just fun things, but I appreciate everybody listening in. I hope it was valuable. I hope you guys took some lessons away that really, truly help you uh, because I really want to see really good people who want to help others succeed in this industry, right? That's who, that's who deserves to succeed coming out of this are the people who give a fuck, the people who are willing to go through and watch every webinar, your favorite people put out, watch every resource, read every blog, sharpen their tool to get better because 
This industry is about helping others. That's why we're all here. So make sure you're prepared to help people the best way you can. And that's right now we have that opportunity. So I appreciate everybody listening, tuning in. The best gift you can give someone is your full attention. And I appreciate it. And gentlemen, thank you so much for the time and invitation. Anytime, we'd love to do it again with you. Absolutely, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Follow Sam, follow True Coach. I didn't, the 30-day free trial out, putting out, you, there's no obligation there. You, you just, Sam just said, you don't have to put your credit card in. If you're worried about, because we're getting questions about this stuff too. Well, what would I actually do? What's the program that I can use? Well, try that one and see if you like it. You know, so just take action. Mm -hmm. Do something. Yep. Listen to this again. T take another action. Build on that. Uh, so action. again, I yeah. Jared, John, thanks so much for joining as always. Uh, Sam, again, much, much appreciated everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We will send out the recording as soon as possible. And uh, until next time, hope it was helpful. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, so Sam. Much. Thanks, everybody. Take care, y'all.